Good morning, everybody. We'll get started here in just a moment. We will be doing a quick audio test. If y'all can hear me over there in the world of Facebook, let me know. Looks like we've got YouTube up. Looks like we've got the group up. Just doing a couple final tests before I kick this off. Appreciate it, guys. Woo. See that blue dot? That's Steve. Just looking at houses left and right. Let them go. Get the Propelia mobile app and drive for dollars today. All without leaving your car. All right, everybody. So what is this? What is this that we're going to be doing? We are looking for, what are we looking for? We are looking for land. Okay, there we go. So what are we going to do? Like as a wholesaler, Back in 2012, 2013, I would be sending out mail all the time, vacant properties, vacant, et cetera. And I'd have people call me up and say, hey, I don't want to sell my house, but I inherited some land that I'd like to get sold. Hey, 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 would you buy my land? And I wasn't smart enough back then. I didn't understand what to do with land. So I'd always just tell them, no, no, I don't, I don't know what to do. And as I became more and more um, educated, I guess, I started understanding the value of land and some of the things that you can do with it. So outside of just you know, accidentally getting land leads. If you're looking to do something like this, you can use all of the exact same things that you're doing to wholesale and market to houses to find land. Just go out, try and find lead lists that you can use to find vacant land, and then start sending mail and direct mail straight to uh, land. Let me get something off my screen so real quick. Something's distracting me here. And when you find this land, there's certain things you're going to need to know to find out whether or not this makes sense for for you to actually go out and purchase this land. You know, there's nothing going to be worse than buying this land and then finding out, oh, I can't stick a mobile home on it. I just now got some land and like I don't know what to do. That's a bad situation to be in. You don't want to be in that. So I'm going to discuss with you all today the, the due diligence you need when you find land to say, okay, can I put a mobile home on it? Um, does it have the utilities? Okay, what kind of utilities can I put on it? You know, and all the little different little things that you're going to need to know to find out, can I put a mobile home there? And then some of the things you need to actually do to prepare the land to put the mobile home on it. So I'm kind of taking this class from the top of my head. So bear with me. I do have the opportunity to answer questions right now. This is live at the moment. So feel free to join in and ask questions. If I see it, I'll try and uh, deal with it directly then. But Aside from just doing the land piece of it, you know, we're going to discuss where to find the mobile home because you can find the land and I can tell you like the, all the same things you're doing right now to try and find a house is applicable to try and find land. Any of the list research you're doing, do that same list research, but instead of looking for your 
their typical three bed, two bath, two car garage home, specifically start looking for land to start applying this type of methodology to. You're all of the same marketing, all of it. It's the exact same thing. We're just going to add a couple new layers of due diligence onto this. So let's say you're doing your marketing and you find your property. Okay. Once you have found the property and you're like, I think this is good. I think this is good as good enough. Like that's, that's close enough to getting you to where you need to go. Put the property under contract. Now, what do I mean by put the property under contract? Exact same thing as single family homes. This is not that big of a deal. Like you're going to use just a typical contract. You might have a specific state promulgated land contract. I can only speak on Texas. Texas Real Estate Commission has a land contract you can use, but get that land contract. And just like you're trying to wholesale a house, you're going to need some sort of due diligence period, some sort of feasibility period. You're going to need some time to find out, you know, will the city or this county or the state or whoever it is allow me to bring a mobile home onto this land? Now, I'm going to use the term mobile home a lot in this conversation. This term should be directly interchangeable with manufactured home. Manufactured home, though, is the correct term to use. I say mobile home all the time because it's what I'm used to, but you really should get into the habit, I, I should too, of using the term manufactured home. They're different. And even when you're going to the county or the city to try and decide whether or not this is feasible for you, you may find out that you need uh, to use the right term because you might go to them and say, hey, can I put a mobile home on the land? And they'll say no. And then, you know what, you'll say, can I put a manufactured home on the land? And they'll say, yes. Um, I, I bring up that little nuance, and let me give you an understanding of what the difference between the two is. Any home built before 1976, I believe 1976 was the date, is considered a mobile home. It was not built uh, to housing and urban development standards, HUD standards, um, MHSA. Those types of things were not adhered to. And those are typically what is referred to as a mobile home, pre-1976. Homes built post-1976 are tend to be called a manufactured home. And I know that's a nuance, but I think that nuance is important for you to learn if you're going to be dealing with manufactured homes. So I'm going to try and use the right term for the rest of the show, a manufactured home. But I get this property under contract. I get this land under contract. What are the key things that I need to figure out during this option period? Give yourself an option period. Like give yourself, I'd say at least probably one week. That's like the minimum that I would probably want to get myself. But give yourself two weeks. And the entire... The entirety of that option is up to you to negotiate. Like you might go to one seller and they're like, there's no way I'll give you a three week option period. I, I, I won't give you more than two weeks. Well, I mean, this is a negotiation. I can't go through and explain every single piece of that to you, but try to get yourself a, a substantial option period, at least a couple of weeks. When you're dealing with single family homes, a lot of people are like, you know what, five days, six days, 10 days. Um, and, you know, typically you're not going to get a couple of weeks on a on a single family home. That depends on your negotiations, of course, but that's not the standard. But try to get yourself at least a couple of weeks during that option period. Now, what do you need to do when you have this property under contract and you have an option period involved with this? And let me let me add something else to this because I think it's important. This due diligence period is a good piece for you to have and going through and figuring all this out. But there might be some people right now watching this like, man, I'm listening to everything that Daniel's talking about for the rest of this show. I don't have the money to do all that. I don't have the money to, 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 to go out and buy this mobile home. I don't have this or that. Guess what? Just like you can wholesale a single family house contract, you can wholesale a land contract. If you're a well-networked person and you know a lot of mobile home investors that would be interested in doing a deal like this, if the numbers make sense, you could probably still wholesale that contract. So don't limit yourself to saying, I have to go through with this whole thing. If you have a strong network and you can get these deals closed, don't just go locking up a bunch of land that you can't close. But if you're confident that you can get this closed, you can wholesale this contract just like you could wholesale a single family home contract. You can pretty much wholesale any contract you get. I wanted to make that clear right now because some of y'all watching might say, I don't have the funds to get this done and you just give up and say, I don't want to do this. You can add this to your wholesaling repertoire. So moving forward, what do I need to figure out during the contract period? There's quite a few things. Similar to a single family home, one of the first things I'm going to want to do with that contract is submit it to a title company. If you're in another state that uses a title attorney, use the, use the terms interchangeably. I want to send this land contract into my title company as soon as possible, and there's a few key things that I want to find out from them. Most title companies, when you send them the contract, at least for me, 
the way I work with my my title companies and the processes that I have them trained with is I expect them to get me what's known as an abstract of title as soon as possible. And when I say as soon as possible, that's not like five days from now, seven days from now. I want my abstract of title in 24 to 48 hours. And if it's 48 hours, I'm kind of antsy. I'm like, why, why is this taking so long? Get me an abstract of title ASAP. What do I mean by an abstract of title? What is the abstract of title going to do for me? The abstract of title is going to give me a long list of all potential legal documents or encumbrances. What I mean by encumbrances is potential liens or potential problems that I might have with the title. It's going to show me all of the deed transfers. It's going to show me any of the subdivision docs. It's going to show me, uh, excuse me, deeds of trust. It's going to show me all the little legal documents recorded in any potential non-recorded legal documents that might come into play with this property. There's a few key things that I'm going to want to look for whenever I'm looking at this aspect of, how do I say this? When I'm dealing specifically with land that I'm wanting to develop with a mobile home. All right. So one thing that I'm going to look at, the deed of trust. Now, depending upon what state you're in, that might be, what I'm essentially looking for is the security instrument. Uh, in a non-judicial state, that's going to be a deed of trust. In a judicial state, that's going to be the mortgage. I'm wanting to look at the deed of trust that transferred the ownership from the previous person to me. There might be some deed restrictions. I'm going to want to look at the warranty deed as well. Uh, maybe not even so much the deed of trust. I may have misspoke. I want to see the deed, the warranty deed, general warranty deed, special warranty deed, whatever kind of deed it is. Preferably not a quick claim deed, but I want to see the deed. Why do I want to see the deed? Why does this even matter to me? Great question. Um, someone's asking me, do I pay for abstracts of title? I do not. Uh, most title companies will want to charge you for an abstract of title. If you're doing a high volume of business with your title company, you should probably be able to negotiate. It's like, hey, like I'm doing enough business with you. I shouldn't have to pay for every abstract. I'm closing deals with you. Get me that abstract. Those abstracts are important to me. But back to the back to the subject. Why is that deed important? there may be what is known as a deed restriction. And it's not just the last transfer or the transfer before that. I'm going to want to look back through these deeds and verify that there's not a deed restriction. To give you an example, I bought some land out in, who? what county was that? Kaufman County. It was in Forney. I was previously looking to buy as much land as I possibly could in an appreciating area uh, to take advantage of some of the appreciation while taking advantage of the tax exemptions plus a homestead. I wanted to buy as much land as I possibly could in Kaufman County as fast as I could in or near Forney. That property had deed restrictions. Well, what kind of deed restrictions did it have? Well, when this property was originally sold, the guy that sold it said, you know what? I'm going to be the neighbor. He owned a big chunk of land. He took a little piece of that land and he sold it to someone else. But when he sold it to that person, he didn't want that to turn into a mobile home park. He didn't want to turn it into a, 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 a pig farm. Well, he put a deed restriction in when he sold the property that said this property can never occupy any pigs. There can be never pig farm here at all. And there can never be a mobile home on this land. Well, if you don't find that out and you buy this and you throw a mobile home on it, you might have somebody coming over there and knocking on your door saying, hey, uh, there's a deed restriction on this property that says you're not allowed to put a mobile home on here. I'm glad that the county said you could. I'm glad that you got a permit to do it. I'm glad that it's there. But I'm also glad to know that I put it in writing whenever I sold this land 10 years ago that there would never be a mobile home on this property. And I'm going to sue you and I'm going to force you to remove that out of here. Now, let me explain how hairy of a scenario that could be. Let's say you do develop this land and you spend five or six months and you get all this work done. You get you put wells on it. You bring in all your utilities and you get your mobile home there and you sell the home. What happens whenever that person finds out there's a mobile home here and they start suing the current homeowner and then the homeowner turns around and sues you and all of this goes upside down? Not good. This is why your due diligence period is there. That's why I said when you get your option contract that you put this in as part of your due diligence. Write down really big on your due diligence. Review your deeds. This is going to give you insight as to whether or not there are any specific deed restrictions. All right. The deed is one piece of it. But I also asked the title company for an abstract of title. What am I looking for outside of just the deed? I'm also going to look for the subdivision plat and the subdivision documents. This may be in an area that doesn't have a subdivision. If I do have a subdivision, 
I need to know what that subdivision will allow. Even if I'm driving through and I'm like, every home in this subdivision is a mobile home or a manufactured home to be a better term. Well, that's great. But there still might be restrictions on A, the size of the home, the exterior uh, finish out of the home, minimum porch sizes, minimum fencing requirements, maximum land use. Like maybe I'm saying, okay, there's eight acres here. I can buy that eight, eight, eight acres, divide it up into four two acre lots, put four new mobile homes on here, and bam, make a really good killing. For those that don't know, buying larger tracts of land and subdividing them into smaller tracts of land is a great way of increasing your chances of making some serious money on this. But I want to look at the subdivision plat. I want to look at all of the information that is recorded in that subdivision for the requirements of what I can actually put in here, such as you know size of home, type of home. And some of them might say no mobile homes allowed at all. You don't want to end up in that scenario where you go out and you buy this land and you go through the process of developing, or even if you don't develop it, you just bought land that you can't do what you wanted to do with it. Get that stuff figured out. So once the abstract of titles ran, look for deeds, look for um, subdivision information. And then from there, oh, what else can we do? Mm, that's kind of the abstract of title part. I'm kind of pulling this off the top of my head, so, so bear with me there. Now, we're still under option period. I've got the abstract of title ran. I've looked through the deed and I've looked through the other uh, items that show up on the abstract for deed. What else should I be considering? You should also look for the city's approval. If this is within the city, if it's not within the city, you're gonna to need to talk with the county. You may need to talk with both. You want to talk with the, the city slash county as much as possible. Who should I be talking to? Depending on the city, most all cities that I know of, counties, etc they're gonna have some sort of planning and zoning department. You're gonna wanna go sit down, you're gonna wanna go just check out a portion of your day, uh, more than just a phone call, like go in there and try and sit down and talk to these people. It's like, okay, here is the street address, here's the legal description of the property that I'm looking to purchase. You know, am I allowed to develop this with a mobile home? And the city is gonna come through and get you from, um, I got distracted for a second. Excuse me. Let me catch my train of thought. For those that don't know, I've got really bad ADD. I get on rabbit trails in my mind and I get I get, I get lost. I think I was talking about planning and zoning. Go spend some time. Sit down at planning and zoning. Find somebody that you can chew on their ear a little bit and get them to, to open up and talk to you. Um, you're going to want to find out, A, are they going to allow you to bring a mobile home in? Okay. Now, outside of just this, you're going to want to find out other little pieces of information. You might want to be able to find out from them, okay, um, do I have roadside water? You know, do I have underground utilities such as electrical? Now, if you're driving down the road and you can see power lines, you know you've got above ground electrical, but if you, that's part of what you, I'll talk about utilities here in a second, because utilities are a whole different topic and we'll talk about utilities. But while you're there at planning and zoning, try and find out what utilities are available at the property and then what restrictions they might put on the land. Say, okay, there is no city sewer here. Let's just, let's throw this out as a scenario. There's no city sewer here. Can I put a septic system on the land? Well, they might say, yes, you can put a septic system, but there's a maximum of one septic system per two acres. Or maybe there's a maximum of one septic system per acre. You know, they might give you restrictions saying, okay, these are the types of things you can do. You know, am I allowed to drill a well? Am I allowed to put a septic system on there? Because those might change. Let's say, okay, yeah, you're allowed to put a septic system on there, but I didn't say I wanted to put a well on there. Well, if I put a well on there, then I might have to have at least three acres. You know, there's little things you want to find out from there. So try your best to get in touch with somebody there at planning and zoning. It's best to kind of bring a little party favor, bring them a little donut, something, because sometimes those people have rough days. They're always getting yelled at. People are mad at them. Oh, you blah, 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 blah. Try and make their day as comfortable as can. So that way you can try and kind of uh, chew on their ear a little bit and get some more information out of them. But you're going to want to find out from planning and zoning, am I allowed to permit and bring a mobile home in? And am I allowed to put these types of utilities in? What types of utilities are available on the land? What type of utilities can I bring into the land? And that brings me into the next phase of this conversation, which is directly dealing with utilities. Okay. Let's just deal with water for now. Okay. Now remember for everybody that's watching right now at the beginning of the show, I said for everybody that watched this all the way to the end, 
I've got a little special treat for you. I got something that might help you all out with some of this due diligence. I built a little spreadsheet that kind of goes through and helps me out with some of this stuff. It's kind of like a little due diligence checklist and a little number calculator that I created. If you all want access to that, make sure you'll stick around to the end and I'll tell you how to get it. Okay. So um, let's see here. Let's see here. Let's see here. Where was I at? Utilities. Water. Okay. There's different ways of getting water to your land. You might have a mu municipal utility district. You might have a co-op water supply. You might have you might have a city water supply. Those are all good things to know. But you're also going to need to know where is that located. Okay, maybe I've got a main road, and then off of the main road is a street, and my property's down here somewhere. So let's say maybe I'm three or four hundred foot off of the main road on a, on, a, on, a, on a small dirt road. These are the things I'm talking about. These are the things that might be showing up. Well, OK, the city's like, yeah, there's water available over there, but it's way up here, 300 foot away. And my property's down here somewhere on, on another on another side of the road. I'm going to have to pay to get that water all the way down the road and to my land. So do I actually have public utility water at the road? That's important. Other things to find out about that water. Is there a tap already there? What do I mean by a tap? Well, there might be a pipe running down the road, but it doesn't have a little valve or someplace for me to connect. So I'm going to have to pay to get a water tap done. Okay, that's not a, that's not a deal breaker. You know, maybe that water tap costs me $3,000. I don't know. You know, it might cost me $2,000. It might cost me $20,000. Depends on your area. But if you find out in advance, okay, there is a water line there there is a water tap already there, then I know I don't need to spend that money. If there's not a water tap there, though, I might need to include that in there. To give you some references on costs, like I've done new construction properties, I've built properties from the ground up, I've built multi-million dollar houses. Your network is your net worth. People say that all the time, like your network is your net worth. When I'm doing bids for construction, like like I'm a, a property I did over in Highland Park, a very astute area of Dallas, um, multi-million dollar homes. I got bids for a sewer tap. Some of those bids were $15,000. Some of those bids were $20,000. Some of my lowest bids were in that 10 to $12,000 range. But my network gave me access to people that the general public wouldn't often be able to find. And that is, that is somebody that would do a sewer tap for $3,500. So can you see the difference between being, being networked and being able to, to build this in? My sewer tap costs 3,500. The other person's sewer tap costs 15,000. If you have your network established, you can get these done at a much lower cost. And that is a big portion of being able to do these types of things, creating a solid network of people. All right, so I need to find out about the water. We've discussed that. We've talked about we've talked about municipal utility districts, also known as MUDs. We've talked about co-ops. We've talked about city water. We're going to need to find out from whoever is the water supplier around there, do I have a, a street side feed? If not, where am I going to have to get it from? And I'm going to have to figure out how much it's going to cost me to get that water to my land. Now, there's going to be scenarios where you don't have this option. There's just no water available. All right, this is where you're going to have to look at and decide, can I put a well on the property? Okay, can I put a well on the property? Well, you know, just dig a hole in the ground deep as you have to go, find a natural water supply underground and tap yourself in a well. Okay, not every property can have a well put on it. You know, some properties have no water in them at all. There's, there's, I don't care how far you dig, you're not going to get water. There's other properties that do have water under it, but it's seasonal. There's nothing you like having a property that you've developed that has seasonal water. You're going to want to figure this out. How are you going to figure this out? Call up a local well digging company or a regional well digging company and say, hey, I want to develop this property with a well. Can you do it? Well, they have maps and their maps say, OK, here's all the underground water supplies. They're going to look at your little your little section of land and then they're going to decide whether or not you have the ability to put a well on that. OK, so these are some of the things you're going to need to find out just from the water side of things. Find out where is the water. Just because you have street water or you have city water, et cetera, you've got water at the street. Let's say we talk about that scenario earlier where I've got like a main road up here and I've got a little side road coming down and my house is over here somewhere and the water is over here. It might cost you more money to get the water from the main road down to your property than it is to dig a well. 
wells around my area cost about seven dollars a foot so if you have to go 100 foot underground which is you know an atypical um uh well dig at least in my area that's a seven thousand dollar well okay so that's one way of kind of throwing some of those thoughts into there so we've discussed water what other utilities do we need we need sewage and we need electric let's talk about sewer okay does the property already have some type of sewer on the land? Does it have city sewer? Does it have a septic system? Okay, if it does have a septic system, what type of septic system is it? Um, some areas will no longer allow what's known as like a conventional septic system, something with a tank and a leach field. Uh, I'm not going to get discussed. I'm not going to get deep into that discussion. If you don't understand what leach fields are, go Google that. But most places are going to require you to put in an aerobic system. An aerobic system is a much better system in terms of um, efficiency, etc. So, how much is an aerobic system going to cost you? Now, if you're looking for that in Texas, I might be able to get an aerobic system put in for as little as 6,500 to 7,500 if I have a really strong network, but you're probably going to be spending somewhere between $8,000 to $12,000 depending upon the land you're going to pay to put that in. All right. So if I've got a septic system, they have to be permitted. Okay. Remember how I told you had that conversation with the zoning department, we should probably also have conversations with the permitting department and say, Hey, I'm wanting to put a septic system on this land. Is it, is it, is it allowed? They have size requirements. They may even have soil requirements. Just because you have three acres of land, they want a specific type of soil. You know, if the soil doesn't absorb um, the, the 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 spray water very well, then they might want you to have five acres. They may want you to have 10 acres. So you've got to have to find out, can I permit a sewer system on this land? So what happens if you've already got sewer at the road, though? Well, same scenario. You're going to have to find out how much a sewer tap is going to cost you. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, for me, those prices vary greatly depending upon your network. I can get a sewer tap uh, for as little as um, $3,500, but my average bid was ten grand to twenty-five grand. Thirty-five hundred dollars is a lot cheaper than twenty-five grand. But if I didn't know about that resource, I wouldn't have known it. And I would have been like, man, I can't put 20, 20 grand on this sewer tap. That's going to completely blow my budget. I had somebody just ask me, what is an aerobic system? Um, that is a great question. I would I would suggest hitting up Google. Like some of these little terms like that, I would say are probably best served for Google. Uh, if I'm hitting you up with some terms like that that you don't understand, let's 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 hit up Google. They'd be able to explain it far better than I could, and it might take five or ten minutes to discuss in depth what the aerobic system itself is. But it's essentially a tank that uses sprinkler heads to disperse the water throughout the land. Okay, so. We've talked about sewer, we've talked about septic, we've talked about water, we've talked about wells. What about electric? Electric is a big, big, big one. Um, do I have overhead electric nearby? Do I have underground electric nearby? Just because you don't see utility poles with wire doesn't mean, doesn't mean that there's not electric there. It may be underground electric. But you're going to need to find it out from the local electric provider, your planning and zoning. Hey, where is the electric at in this area? They might go through and look at their little maps and say, okay, your nearest nearest electricity tap is three quarters of a mile away. All right, that's not necessarily a deal killer, but that can certainly put a big wrench in your system. All right, from there, you might have to say, okay, if I develop this land, would you commit to bringing utilities to the roadside? So if you're committing to develop the land, we'll bring poles in, we'll bring power in, we'll bring power to your land. You're responsible from everything from the road back to your property. Okay, well, that means I might need to put up a pole. I might need to put up a, uh, a loop, you know, figure out exactly what you're looking for from the utility department. But they might be willing to bring the power to your land. Um, they're not going to bring it all the way to the house. You might be responsible from the house to the road, but they might be willing to bring it in. So just because it's not there doesn't mean that it's a deal killer. But you do want to figure out what's the timeline for getting that done. You might say, okay, that's great. And you're thinking, I'm going to go buy this land. I'm going to develop it. I'm going to get it sold. I'll have this all done in six months. Well, you find out from the utility company that's responsible for bringing the power in. They're like, uh, this is like an 18-month ordeal. We'll do it for you, but we're not going to do it. We're backed out for the next 18 months. All right. 
that works into your thought process that goes through in everything and doing all that together. Apparently my daughter's watching and really enjoying watching daddy go, are y'all enjoying this? Are y'all, are y'all getting some good information on this? Do y'all feel like y'all are getting what y'all expected to get out of this class for that question to be said, there's a lot more to come. Um, I do have a spreadsheet built specifically for y'all. If y'all want to stick around to the end, uh, for all that to be said, I'm gonna take a short break for a quick commercial and I'll be right back after about 30 seconds. This is Steve. Steve is a successful real estate investor. Steve is wearing glasses, so therefore you know he's a successful real estate investor. You go, Steve. Go, Steve, go. Go get those dollars. You see that blue dot? That's Steve. Just looking at houses left and right. Let him go. Get the Propelia mobile app and drive for dollars today. All without leaving your car. All right. To recap where we're at so far, where have we gotten to? Where are we going? So far, we've talked about, okay, some of the ways of possibly to find the land. We've talked about putting it under contract, what we should do in the option period. We've talked about abstracts of title. We've talked about, oh, wow, what all we talked about? We've talked about deeds of trust. We've talked about the deeds. We've talked about the subdivisions. We've talked about utilities. A lot of stuff we've talked about so far. Let me go through and think through. Here's another one that you want to be aware of. And here's another one that you need to be talking about when you're talking about planning and zoning, and you're talking about permitting, you're talking about all those different things. There's thing called a grandfather clause. That's what I'm going to call it. There's going to be times where, you know what, maybe you do find some land and it's already got a mobile home on it. The mobile homes just beat down. And when I say beat down, like mobile homes are normally kind of square. It's like folded over and it's just a pile of rubble that would be better to burn than to move. You're sitting here thinking, great, I can put a mobile home on this land. <laughs> it's already got a mobile home on the land. Like, I don't need to do any of this planning and zoning. That doesn't matter. There's a mobile home there. I can put a mobile home there. We're done. No, do not become that person. And when you're talking with planning and zoning, ask them a very important question. That is, is there any sort of transfer clause? Is there any sort of grandfather clause? Is there anything that says that, yes, there's a mobile home there right now, but if the property ever changes owners or if the mobile home is ever removed, will you allow a mobile home to go back on? You would be surprised at how often there is the chance that that could happen. Like, I'll tell you about a little, 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 little mobile home park I bought probably, wow, damn, I'm old. I bought that mobile home park probably eight years ago. Damn. It's been a long time. I've been doing this for a while. I bought a little mobile home park about eight years ago. It had four or five mobile homes on it. And like I said, it was a small park. It was only like three acres and it had five mobile homes on it. I bought it and I didn't do this. I didn't talk to him about this. This was some of the things that I found out. The city didn't want that park there anymore. The city didn't want it to, to be there. It was overdeveloped. What do I mean by overdeveloped? Their requirements, the city's requirements, I keep saying city, but it was really the county. The county's requirements were that you are not allowed to have more than one septic system per two acres, and that there was not to be more than one dwelling on a septic system, meaning I can't put one septic system there and route five mobile homes to it. Not possible. So it had to be one septic system per housing unit and only one septic system per two acres. I had five housing units. I had two or three acres, which means I could only have one septic system and I could only have one unit. All right. Now, if this is my park and I'm planning on driving it and building it and, 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 and operating it as a mobile home park, I now know I can take no mobile home off that land. If I take a mobile home off that land, the city flat out said, we will not give you a permit to pull a new one in. Every The only thing that can be done there is, um, is I believe what they said was a like kind exchange, which was ridiculous. If it was a 1976 two bed, two bath, and it got destroyed in let's say a tornado or some natural disaster, that would be the only time they would allow me to permit bringing one back in but it had to be essentially the exact same type of home. There couldn't be any upgrades. There couldn't be anything. And it's like, well, this is crazy. So that was essentially the way it was set up. So I need to find out if there's any transfer clause, any grandfather clauses. Those are things you need to know. Okay. 
Let's see, what else do we have here? Another good one. Can I actually install a mobile home? Let's say I can get a permit. Let's say I can get uh, the, the city's blessing to bring this mobile home in. You might find yourself in a position where you physically cannot bring a mobile home in. There is just no way for a tractor trailer, a semi trailer to put this home on a trailer and get it to the house. Let's say there's a load zoned bridge. Let's say the little area that you're planning on develop has a small bridge coming into it. That bridge is not safe enough to bring a mobile home across. Maybe that's why the seller is selling it to you and they've never, you know, you know, sellers are supposed to disclose these types of things when they're talking to you. Um, not all sellers disclose everything they should disclose. Maybe that's the reason why there's not a mobile home on it right now is say they bought it. They wanted to put a mobile home on it, but they couldn't. The bridge wouldn't allow it and there was no other way to get a mobile home in. So you want to contact a mobile home mover and say, hey, I've got this land. Is there any obstructions or things that would cause this to be an unsafe move or a property that you cannot get to? You know, there might be restrictions on, you know, the access to actually bring the home in. Maybe there's power lines that have to be dealt with. Maybe they need special permits to move some things around to get the mobile home to you. That might take you from what you're thinking is, okay, you know what, maybe this, this double wide is gonna cost me $6,000 to move. Going from, okay, that mobile home is gonna cost me $6,000 to get there. No, it's actually gonna cost $28,000 to get there. Why? Because it's got all these special scenarios that this mobile home mover is gonna have to deal with to get this mobile home to my land, all right? We've talked about a lot. If y'all are getting value out of this, make sure we get some thumbs ups, give some people some tags, some shares, do all those wonderful things. Make sure you tell people about Propelio. Make sure you tell people about Propelio TV. Let's move on to the next piece. There's more than one piece. There's a lot going on here. I'm um, talking about developing land for a mobile home. I got a lot to talk about. All right. Um, let's talk about the actual land itself. Um, it's needless to say, if this land is heavy, heavy, heavy timber, and there's a lot of forestry there, you might not be able to get a mobile home on it without some initial development. You're going to need to move and clear some trees. You're going to need to uh, make the land applicable for, for a mobile home to go on. So if there is some extremely heavy, dense trees, you're going to need to clear some of that out to get your mobile home in. Now, just because you have land doesn't mean that land is good for a mobile home. Is that land in a floodplain? Okay. You don't want to buy land that whenever the, the, the next rain comes, it turns into a swamp for four months. That does not work out for you. So you're going to want to find out if it's in a floodplain. That should be able to be something your title company can tell you. You should be able to also be able to, from the city and planning department, find out whether or not you've got a, a, um, a floodplain there. But um, beyond just that, a mobile home needs a pad. What do I mean by a pad? Um, kind of like the same thing as with the house. When you build a house and you place it on the land, you're going to want water to flow away from the property. I've got a property right now I'm dealing with that on. I need to get it graded and get it fixed up. Um, but the water should flow away from the, the dwelling unit. This is the same thing with a mobile home. If you've got really flat land and it rains, all that water is just going to puddle up. It might not be a floodplain, but the water's still going to puddle up. So you're going to have to develop what's called a pad. You're going to need to bring some dirt in. You might be able to get that dirt from the property itself. You might be able to level out the, the ground a little bit and collect some dirt, but you're going to need to make a little bit of a hill that allows the water to shed away from the mobile home, the manufactured home. You can't have water puddling underneath that mobile home. Um, uh, I'm not looking to say in any floodplain. If there's a floodplain, I don't mind if the property itself has a floodplain on it, but let's say I'm getting a five acre tract. Well, I need a substantial portion of that, that property to not be in a floodplain. Like one acre of it can be, and that's cool. And like, that doesn't bother me. I'm not planning on putting a mobile home in that, in that, in that floodplain over there. As long as I got some area of that land that's not in a floodplain, that'll give me direct access from the road frontage, I'm okay with it. The floodplain is not a no-go. It just can't be a floodplain where I plan to put my mobile home. And when you're talking about a couple acres, you might have something like that where you've got a small section of it that is a floodplain. I don't want to deal with that part of it, okay? So I need to develop a pad. And then beyond just developing a pad, I need to develop some sort of of drive approach to get to the to the manufactured home so you know we might just put down some road base some caliche rock you know stir up the ground create a capped road 
capped road, meaning kind of like it, the water sheds off of it and away from it. And the final things that I'm going to think about is fencing. You know, I need to put some kind of fencing on this property. I might. I might go as cheap as no fence. You know, I might not have to put a fence on there. Depending on who my buyers are, I need to go through thinking about, do I put bob wire on there? Do I put a, a horse wire fence up? Do I put a panel fence up? What kind of fence am I going to put up? And once I've put all of that together, I need to take into consideration all those costs. What are the costs we've talked about so far? We've talked about utility exploration. We've talked about, we've talked about, creating the pad. We've talked about creating the road. We've talked about uh, planning and zoning and permitting. We've talked about the actual move of the mobile home. Let's talk about a very smart topic, a very important topic. When I develop this, what type of mobile home am I actually going to put on it? That's probably smart to know. Okay. I put this post out, I don't know, a week or two ago. And I had a lot of people join in. It's like, hey, I want to deal with mobile homes. I want to deal with mobile homes. I had one person that said, you know, since COVID, the delivery times for a new mobile home went from, you know, a couple months now to seven, eight months. I had another person chime in. I think it was uh, up in Indiana. I think it was Indiana. They said it was typically an 18-month turnaround to get a mobile home from the manufacturer to their, to their land. If 18 months is kicking your butt, and in most cases, you probably don't want to be exposed to the market for 18 months on something like this, new mobile home's not going to make any sense. Would I like to develop with a new mobile home? I most certainly would. Um, let's say a really nice new mobile home is going to cost me around a hundred grand. And let's say I was able to buy the land for let's say thirty thousand, and it's going to cost me. I'm just throwing some rough numbers in there. Let's say it's going to cost me another thirty thousand to develop the land. So all in, I'm in to it for one hundred and sixty grand between the mobile home. The land acquisition and the land development, I'm into it for 160 grand. Resale value on this developed unit is going to sell for about 210, which leaves me about a $50,000 gross profit. I back out any utility commissions, closing costs, I, I realtor commissions. Let's say I'm able to net $35,000 off of a deal. Those are some rough numbers, but those are not rough numbers that I would I would say that are unfeasible. You know, it might take you a little bit to find a deal like that. This isn't just like you're going to go out there tomorrow and become some mobile home developer, multimillionaire. But if you're persistent with this and you really put some effort into this, I think this is a niche that you can really go out and make some money off of. But if the new mobile home is going to cost you a hundred grand to get. And it's going to take 18 months for it to be delivered. That might not work out for you. Okay. So what other options do we have? You've got to learn to be able to shift and move and overcome obstacles. All right. It's 18 months to get a, a new unit. Well, maybe the demand on the used market is going to increase. Okay. How many people in here have, and I'm going to ask this question, like, give me some feedback. Like, have you ever done any marketing and had somebody call you up, you're, you're marketing to single family homes and someone calls you up and they're like, hey, I've got a mobile home I wanna sell. I got a manufactured home I wanna sell. And maybe you don't have any experience in manufactured housing. And you're like, I don't buy manufactured homes and you just let that deal go down the drain. That happens a lot. I think there's enough people in here that if they're gonna be honest, you're gonna raise your hand and say, I don't know how to deal with manufactured homes that are in a mobile home park. I don't know how to do that. It's okay to be honest. Okay. Well, let's say you are an investor that invests in mobile home parks. I've got a full training on that. It's free. Go to propelio.com forward slash the academy. There's like a 12 or 13 series video on there that teaches people exactly how to develop and work with mobile homes and mobile home parks. Great course. If anybody in here has ever watched that, drop some comments below and say, hey, I've taken that course. I really liked it. Uh, I've also done quite a few free trainings on that in YouTube as well as uh, Facebook. So just go to YouTube and say Propelio Mobile Homes. You'll find you'll find tons of information on those. But let's say I do know how to work with a mobile home inside of a mobile home park. The types of deals that I'm talking about in those trainings are what I would consider to be a low cost deal. Like these properties are going to be under ten thousand all in. What happens when you get a phone call from someone in a mobile home park that's like, hey, I got a double wide. It's a 2012 and I, I still owe 55,000 on it. That doesn't fit the model that I just talked about. If you don't know what I'm talking about, they're kind of called Lonnie deals. Lonnie deals are a very common investing strategy for mobile homes and mobile home parks. Well, that $55,000 mobile home doesn't really fit into my Lonnie model. So if I don't understand how to do something like what I'm talking right now, I might pass up on that on that 2010 double wide. Well, if a brand new double wide is costing me a hundred grand and I can pick up 
and I can pick up a double wide in a mobile home park for 55, I pick it up for 55 grand. It costs me 6,000, 7,000 to get it moved. I'm out into it for 62,000 on my, on my, on my land. But let's say the mobile home's not the best and it's not the it's not the prettiest mobile home. Might I be able to put a quick twenty to twenty five thousand into it and really make that mobile home look good? Like you go through, make the exterior of it look beautiful, put in some nice skirting on there, some nice rock looking skirting, build some nice porches on it, put some nice lighting around the exterior, put yourself in some nice uh, landscaping, and then come on the inside, put all new flooring in it. Let's say you drop thirty thousand into this real quick, you're all into it for ninety two thousand. Um, you still you might you might even be able to put twenty thousand into it, and you might come out with a cheaper deal with a really good outcome. So don't let these manufactured housing development times stop you from moving forward. The most successful investors I've ever met are the ones that see obstacles and don't let that stop them. They are like, okay, that's an obstacle. That's cool. I can figure out how to get past this obstacle. You've got to be resourceful. You've got to think outside of the box. You can't let things stop you from moving forward. This is not going to be easy. I don't ever want to paint the picture of like, this is easy. Like the concepts are easy. It's a very simple process, but it's going to require you to overcome problems. And it's going to require you to, to be diligent. It's going to require you to be um, consistent. Like you can't go out and do this for the next month and then be like, man, this doesn't work, Daniel. You're, you're just selling pie in the sky. No, I'm not. I've done it. I know others that have done it. I've had users just like y'all that are watching right now reach out to me and be like, I just made $250,000 on a mobile home section, a mobile home park that I would have never been able to do without you. I just retired myself from my job because of the trainings that you've given me for free, Daniel. I get those kinds of messages all the time from people that took action, stayed consistent with it, and didn't give up. So th those are my words of advice to you. I don't know if I've got much else I can think of right now. I covered a lot. And I, I didn't have a presentation built for this, so I don't know if I covered all the topics. I'm going to hang around here for a second, though. If you liked what you had, though, and you really, how do I say that? If you got some value out of this, give us some love, give us some claps, give us some yay. And um, I'm going to answer your questions when I get back from this last commercial break. Uh, I'm going to give that commercial break a second. Um, I'm going to kind of ramble here. I'm going to say, what time is it right now? It's 1146 my time. I'm going to give until about 11.50 for questions to come in. If you have questions, I'll try my best to answer them. If you uh, have already asked some questions during the class that I wasn't able to address, uh, I try not to let myself get distracted. I said I'd try to answer them, but if I get distracted, man, I get, I get lost fast. I'm not smart enough to be able to pay attention to comments and get that going through. I got a lot of owner finance buyers that want these types of houses on a little bit of land. This is good stuff. For people just like you, this is a great opportunity to go out and buy larger tracts of land. If y'all are already doing Lonnie deals, this is a great way for you to monopolize and expand your business. Go out and buy 10, 20, 30, 40 acre tracks. Find ways of doing that. Let's say, oh, I don't got money. That's an obstacle. Find a partner. Money is one of the easiest things to get, especially in a, in a unit like this. And if you ask a question, please hit me up again because these comments flow through fast. Um, go out and get 10, 20, 30, 40 acre tracks. And when you do that, make sure from the city that you can subdivide this thing. But if you can subdivide that 40 acres down into five acre tracks, you've got some math going on there. But what is that like 40 acres, five acre tracks? That's what eight lots? God, my math is horrible today. If you can develop eight lots and you can put all that together, that might be an extra $300,000 in net profit. So one of the things that my mentors always told me is like, if you're out there chasing small deals, you'll get small paychecks. If you're out there chasing big deals, you'll get paid big paychecks. Chase another zero. Like if you just made 5,000, try to make sure your next deal is 50,000. If your last deal is 50,000, try to make sure your next deal is 500,000. If your last deal is 500,000, try to make sure your next deal is $5 million. If you're constantly chasing small paychecks, and I think there's a lot of people on here right now that would probably agree to this. They might not want to admit to it that, you know what, they've done 10 deals, they've done 20 deals, they've done 30 deals, but they don't have the lifestyle that they thought they were going to have. You are probably still chasing what got you the results you got right now. The results you got right now was the last deal you did. If that last deal, that might be a good stepping stone to get you somewhere else. That's exactly how I got here. Like I'm no magic magician. My first deals were $5,000 deals. I was making 5,000, I was making 5,000, I was making 5,000. I was like, man, I want to make 50. 
Then I started doing $50,000 deals and I started doing million dollar deals. And then before long, I started seeing like, wow, this has completely and totally changed my life. I went from looking at life in prison at, two, at 19 years old to, to being essentially a, a net worth multimillionaire in a short period of time, all because of real estate. It is possible, but you got to chase the bigger deals. You can't just constantly do little deals unless you're able to do a massive volume of them. So yeah, look at larger tracts of land and look at subdividing them to, to develop for mobile homes. And then you can take your Lonnie deals and all of your, your mobile home leads and push all of them into a, into a uh, development of land that you've created. Uh, so... Yep. Someone just said, yeah, I have a 2018 Clayton double wide for 55,000 used mobile homes are on the rise. That is a solid deal. That deal, that property is only a couple years old, 55 grand, pull that onto some of your land and you're good. Someone just asked me, what's your main development strategy? Flipping? How are you funding these deals? I am not actively in real estate right now. I have pushed all of my all of my focus into Propelio. For those that don't know what Propelio is, Propelio is a software company that provides leads, provides uh, websites, provides driving for dollars applications, all those fun types of things for real estate investors. It does have a free trial. There's no credit card required. So anybody that's watching this right now, if you want to just even go play around with it, no credit card required. Sign up, mess around, see what you think about it. So if you want to support me, go check that out. Um, so I'm not doing uh, any active real estate investing right now. I do have a portfolio that I manage that I still have that cash flows, cash flows well, but I'm not actively in uh, acquisitions right now. When the market shifts, I will likely move into commercial acquisitions, likely something along the industrial warehouse. I really like industrial warehouse. Do I have a preference for a single versus double wide used mobile homes? This is going to be a, a it depends moment. Okay, if I'm doing Lonnie deals in mobile home parks and I have no intention of moving it, I don't care what the unit is as long as there is a demand for the product in the housing market. I'm not going to go out there and buy something that doesn't have um, demand. Like I might be able to get a one bed, one bath mobile home that's only 900 square foot, but nobody wants to buy it, you know, but I might be in an oil town that's had a big oil boom. We got a bunch of roughnecks moving in. That one bed, one bath might be, you know, worth something. You've got to figure out what the market wants to pay you. And if you find out what the market wants to pay, it doesn't matter. Single, double, anything like that. Now, if I am talking about developing land, and I'm talking about a Lonnie deal, I would almost hand down say I'd want a double wide because it's more appealing for a homeowner. But I am throwing my own personal opinions on there. I prefer to be agnostic to due diligence. I don't want to project my own personal opinions onto due diligence. Due diligence for something like this should come directly from your comparable sales. If I pull open comparable sales and I can look at all the mobile homes on land that have sold in this area, and there's been a ton of single family, uh, single wides sold, and they're selling at a premium, well, I can't discount that there's a demand for it. You know, they're all selling really fast. They're all selling at a premium. Now what I'm going to do is let's say there are a bunch of singles being sold. There are a bunch of doubles being sold. What am I going to do? I am going to pull out the handy dandy Excel spreadsheet and I'm going to say, okay, scenario number one, I developed this with a single wide mobile home. Scenario number two, I develop it with a double wide mobile home. Isn't that funny how single, you know, scenario one is a single, scenario two is a double. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bit. <laughs> what gives me the most money? That's all that matters. I am, I am agnostic to the investment. I am committed to the numbers. If the single pays me more, I'm going to go the single route. If the double pays me more, I'm going to go the double route. That's the only thing that I'm going to look at. I'm not going to allow my own thoughts to project themselves into this deal. Um, you should remain um, disconnected emotionally from your deals, and that's going to give you the best form of due diligence. So for everybody that's stuck around, what did I tell you all? 
I told y'all for those that stuck around and watched this to the very end, for those of y'all that are out there on um, YouTube and you're going get to get to watch this on the Rewind, that's going to help y'all out because y'all can just fast forward to the end and figure out what I was going to say. But I have a spreadsheet that kind of goes through some of these things. It kind of gives you some of the numbers like, okay, if I have to put a well on there, if I have to remove a double wide, if I have to add a fence, if I have to add a septic system, if I have to do this, if I have to do that, it's a simple spreadsheet. Uh, it's not it's not extremely complex, but it's one that I personally use to help fi find and f fumble through these types of deals. If you want that spreadsheet, who here wants that spreadsheet? I hope somebody here wants that spreadsheet. If y'all want that spreadsheet, go to propelio.com and there's going to be a support bubble there. Go to the support and send a message and say, hey, I watched this live and I would like to see if I can get access to that spreadsheet. And I'll send you a link to get that spreadsheet. This goes for if you watch it today, tomorrow, or five years from now, I'll get you access to that spreadsheet. I do want to throw a caveat into there. And this is me trying to give you all some insight into some of the things I deal with. Please don't jump on there and just be rude. Like, I, I can't believe how many people just go on there and be like, give me your spreadsheet. And that's the only thing they say. Like, that's just it. Just give me your spreadsheet. It's like, I'm a human being. Like, treat me with some respect. Don't just come in there and be like, do this and expect me to respond to you in any sort of positive manner. You know what? If you really want to show some support and you really want to say, show some gratitude for me putting on this show, giving you and sharing with you over a decade of my own real estate investing experience, show me some love. Go on there and be like, hey, man, I really appreciated the show. Here was some of the things I learned from it. I've also learned these other things from you. You've allowed me to retire from my job. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have been able to just pull 100000 dollar check. These are the types of messages I've gotten from people. And if you don't have that type of message, don't worry. But don't just come in there and be like, give me your spreadsheet and then expect me to just roll over and, and, and do this for you. Show some love. Come in there and be like, hey, help me out. Give me give me that spreadsheet and I'll send you a link to get that spreadsheet. Give me some time to get that put together for you. But for all of y'all, propelio.com, go check out that spreadsheet. I think I had one more question show up. I'm going to scroll back to it. I'm going to answer this last question. That'll be the end of the day. I have a question that is a bit off topic. Uh-oh, I don't like off topic questions. Do you know what are the regulations on having a camper RV next to your mobile home? And what if someone lives out of it? That is going to be dependent upon your local municipality. They may not allow more than one dwelling unit per land, blah, 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 blah. But that is going to be a local regulation, not a... Um, not a um, a general statement across the United States. So that's something you're going to need to contact your planning and zoning slash XYZ and really dig in to find out if that is a possibility for you. So I appreciate the questions, everybody. I hope you all had a great day. Stay tuned for the final commercial and uh, enjoy. Pelia mobile app and drive for dollars today. All without leaving your car.